Um, so welcome to this very exciting event that we are um, so privileged to host with International Education. Um, you'll learn a little bit more as to what to expect today um, from our student introduction in just a few minutes. Um, but along with the speaker, uh, Martha Sanchez, we have the privilege of also hosting uh, Lauren Swift, who is the Executive Director um, of Children for Change. Change for Ch Sorry, Change for Children. Change for Children, my apologies. Um, and she's been there since 2002, so she has a wealth of knowledge. The organization is based out of Edmonton, and she is their Executive Director. So before we get started with Martha, we're actually going to have Lauren come up and speak a little bit about the organization, um, and then we'll get on with the presentation. So, Lorraine. Thank you very much. We're so privileged and happy to be here at Bow Valley College and to share this information uh, with you guys about our work and about our long-term history in Nicaragua. So Change for Children is 42 years old. We've been around since 1976. And uh, we have done work all over the world. But our most lar our largest investments and the most, most of the work and the projects that we have done over our 42-year history have been in Nicaragua. So we are very... Um, disturbed by what is going on there now and it's actually uh, you know something that we wanted to, to make sure Canadians are aware of because in fact you won't necessarily find it in the media unless you really dig for it. So um, you know dig underneath all of the NAFTA negotiations and all the articles about Donald Trump you can maybe find something about Nicaragua. Uh, and so we're really privileged to, to have Marta with us and I won't uh, introduce her because I know you guys are doing that but uh, it really is a, a privilege to have her here, and we are touring her across uh, Western Canada and visiting a lot of educational institutions and uh, uh, and government offices, uh, just trying to raise awareness and bring bring this uh, this situation to light. So, please, when you uh, when you hear what uh, you you what what we are going to present today, uh, please share this information with others and and please do your part to to bring awareness to this this crisis as well. Thank you very much for having us. Oh, I just wanted to point out too, sorry, there's a bunch of our publications over here. So a lot of these newsletters, annual reports, field reports, so they talk about our work all over the world. And, and of course, there's some large sections uh, about Nicaragua and those. So please feel free to take copies of those. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> so just a few housekeeping items. So one you'll notice, uh, Chad here will be taking a few photos, but predominantly of this speaker. Um, from the IC, we'll be taking one or two photos just in the back so you can post on Twitter, but your faces will be concealed. Um, a note about the presentation, uh, Lauren used, I think, very appropriate words. It is a very disturbing situation that is occurring in Nicaragua, but it is part of that that is so important to bring up and highlight. With that, in the presentation, there might be some visuals um, that you might find triggering or you might find disturbing yourself. Um, and there are a few video clips as well that might do the same. We do absolutely encourage you, if you feel the need to, to leave or step out for a few moments, please do so. Um, and for our learners, just a reminder that we do have counseling services free on campus for all of you. We learn success services if you feel that that's something you need to seek out um, after the presentation. Um, if you do feel the need to maybe uh, speak to one of us, drink some water, and like if you need to step out, um, we can make a couple sessions right here absolutely for your service and assistance. Uh, so now I'll be inviting up uh, Laura Helm from Disability Studies. Laura is a long-term cultural center volunteer, and we always appreciate her helping us out. Uh, Laura is our MC of the IC today. And if you are familiar with that program, it allows learners like yourselves to practice a little bit of public speaking at our events. So Laura today will be introducing our speakers. Please join me in welcoming Laura. <laughs> Um, good afternoon and welcome to the, the collaborative event between International Education and the Intercultural Centre. Some of the work that you will hear about today reflects the goal of the Intercultural Centre's I Advocate series. I Advocate provides a forum for campus and community members to share their views and involvement within various social causes. I Advocate is meant to encourage our campus community to further become engaged in local and global communities through volunteerism and advocacy. Today we are happy to have Martha Sanchez with us. Martha is president for Nicaragua and is an activist and advocate for women's rights. This afternoon she will share firsthand how the current situation of 
civil unrest in Nicaragua on his shoulders and what made from her a foreign country. Martha is a collaborator of working with a number of international and national NGOs in defense of women's rights, specifically economic and reproductive rights, and the right to be a free to violence. Uh, she has participated in multiple global youth forums on the Latin American Feminist Congress. Since 2016, Martha has been a member of the Young Leaders Program for Women Delivered, a global advocate organization for girls' and women's health, rights, and well-being. Martha has also been involved in many environmental movements nationally and regionally, raising awareness about climate change in, Nicar in Nicaragua and its impact on women. Please help me in welcoming Martha Sanchez. Thank you for being here. I'm really glad that you're interested about hearing about what's going on in Nicaragua. Uh, so I'll be doing a presentation over like 10 minutes or something because I really want to have that debate with you with questions and answers. So sadly, I have to start with this slide that actually told that we are living a crisis. It's a human rights crisis, but it's also a humanitarian crisis. But before getting to that, I would like to talk about Nicaragua because I know you're a small country, but <laughs> it's really hard to to find information about it. So we are seven million people in my country. We are actually the the big the, the bigger the biggest country in Central America, and over the seven million, seventy percent of us are under the age of thirty years old, and fifty percent are men. So we are a very young population. And our main economic activities are based on agriculture and cattle, tourism, uh, fishing, and also mining companies like working in Nicaragua. We also have like a recent history uh, of revolution of, of revolution in, in, the, in the 70s. This was actually a revolution against uh, Somoza, that was a dynasty that we have more than 40 years. So in the 70s, we, as a country, with the leadership of Sandinista Party, and actually one of those leaders, Daniel Ortega, was able to get out uh, Somoza from the country. But what happened is that in 2007, um, Daniel Ortega, the leader from the 70s, ran up as a president, as a candidate for the presidency. So as a country, we vote for him in 2007, and now we are leaving another uh, uprising. So I'm going to show you a video about actually what's going on in Nicaragua for, from the, the first month of protest. But I want to say it as well that for us it's really hard to talk about it because we came from, from a revolution leader by Daniel Ortega that now is our president and he's acting as a dictator actually that we want to revolve those years. So I want to leave you this video for a second. <laughs> Yeah, so actually this video shows like the images and the reality of actually the four, the first four months of protests in the country. Um, I want to share with you like a few milestones actually from the crisis. Is that it started on April this year, but I have to say that even when it 
we say that it's Saturn April it isn't from a net from night to day that all started. It was actually um, a strategy over the ten past year the government because Daniel Ortega came to the presidency in two thousand seven. He reformed the constitution to allow reelection and now we are under his control, I would say that like that over eleven years. So we have like a like a slow but really effective strategy to have the over control of the country. So the government has the control of the parliament, of the media, of the of the military services and the police. So on April 18, what happened is actually that Ortega released a reform of our to our social security system that basically was trying to say, okay. Our social security system is in bankrupt, and we need for you to pay more taxes. And we need also that the, that the people that are already pension give 5% of their pension to that national account to sustain the social security system. So basically, the young people said, no, it is enough. Because we are aware that that bankrupt came from a lot of history and a story of corrupt uh, practices. So that day, our young people uh, came out of the street, took the streets, and then Ortega sent military, paramilitary to stop the protest. It was really violent, and I think I want to highlight at this point that social media has been a really huge weapon for us. Because actually, I was in my home, and I was like having a Facebook Live, seeing how all these Sandinistas that were beaten up my my the young people on the streets so everyone in Nicaragua was connected on Twitter and Facebook seeing what was going on right back then and that was the time that we realized the true face of Ortega because the strategy to control the parliament control the media was really subtle you have never seen such a violent strategy until then so the power of social media to connect have, uh, has a, a result that actually we have a national insurrection. It isn't only in Managua, the capital. It isn't only in the cities, also from the rural areas for the Caribbean coast. And also, we have different forms to protest. We have marches, we have barricades. And actually, the barricades were set up to protect the cities because the government has uh, trucks full of people with weapons, just shooting people on the street. So the barricade stopped the communication, stopped the pass of those trucks. So for us, it was a way to protect ourselves as well. We also have, as I say, that like the social media was the main way like how citizens organize themselves. So for example, when I go to, for the first protest, I only I was by myself. I didn't organize nothing. I didn't go out with my friends. I, I go there and I start seeing people and I felt like a company like like company with people that I have never seen before, but we are united to ask for justice and democracy. And also a lot of students um, occupy the university as a way to protest. So we were there and I say we because I feel part of the movement. We were there, like in universities, for over three months, day and night, just saying we have to pressure the government to have justice for all the killings and for all the disappearances and all the repression that was going on. Right. But actually, um, we also have like good things actually because of the protests, because of the pressure of the people. Oh, it's a way to play this video. Um, The second video? Yeah, please. This one. Uh, there's a video here too. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I just want to show you one of the uh, one of the national marches. It was celebrated on Mother's Day. It was actually very symbolic, but right, because there was a march to say we are with the mothers that have lost their sons and their loved ones. So it was this is Managua. This is where I came from. It was. 100,000 people outside saying, we want Ortega to leave. 
and we are with the mothers that are suffering right now the loss of the of the, of their son of their brother of and it was like kilometers of kilometers so i i was there i did i even see the end of the beginning of the march so it was really impressive and that's i think for for my perspective as these are the activities that keep us motivated to say we're not going to step back after what happened so actually it was really hard because it was like a mother's day so the, the call was go with your mother to the march go with your grandma to the march take your daughter to the march and we did that that's what family entire family out of the streets uh participating but what we find at the end was like the government like ortega really feel threatened by this type of movement right so at that day the 10 mothers also lost their sons because when we are reached the destination the final destination we found like police and paramilitary shooting people to scare them away so it was really hard because on Mother's Day, I remember the mother just crying to say, I didn't want to lose my son on this day. And actually, I took my mother to the march, and we were really hectic and everything, and then it was like, if thousands of people showed up, we feel that secure, like we are like a bunch of walking around, but it actually, the government is afraid, actually, for this type of movement. So the second one is after this strategy of marches, we come up with a national dialogue. It was actually what the purpose to negotiate with the government, like a pacific solution for the crisis. So it was conferred the Civic Alliance. That Civic Alliance is composed by young people for private sector, the Catholic Church, the NGO, the peace movement, the women's organization. So we said we need to get together, sit on the table, and start the negotiation with the government. And we did have some results. I must say that our main goal is that Ortega has to leave. We haven't accomplished that, but we have some results. And for me, the most important ones are actually the influence at the international level. Because I know that Nicaragua is, isn't like at the main pages of the, of the newspaper, but actually, the organization of american states have like three meetings just to talk about nicaragua and for us to have the support of that regional platform really give us hope that actually there is something that was going to happen so at that meeting 23 countries from latin america condemn ortega and said we know that you're guilty and we demand justice and early elections because what happened is that Nicara uh, Ortega he, right now is running for his, for his third period, and actually it should end it until 2021. So we say the country will not support and will not sustain three more years of this type of repression, right? So the demand is having early elections. Then we have the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights inside the country. It was really an achievement because the human rights institution in the country that the government was saying, we don't believe those statistics. We don't believe what you're saying. Those are lies. So actually having this regional um, organ or platform to come and, be, and investigate and deliver a report every three months have really give us the support we need at the international level to talk about the crisis, right? And also it was interesting that we also achieved for the first time that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights arrived in Nicaragua to be there, to have the first-hand um, experience with the people that were going to denounce. It was like several thousand of people every day going to that office to tell their stories, to tell their testimonies. So the UN um, had a report, a very hard report about the situation. And then the government of Nicaragua one day say, if, well, one day, no, last week say, okay, so we are done with you. You have two hours to leave the country. The UN actually has to respect that decision because they respect the sovereignty of the countries, right, of the government. So the UN was expelled last week. 
But actually, that message was really important because now the UN has all the evidence and all the background to say that the government doesn't want to get a specific solution of the crisis, right? And also, today we have had four general strikes for 24 hours each. What does it mean that for one day, no one's work, no one's get out of, the, out of their homes, uh, the banks are closed, like the city shut down. And it has been really successful. And uh, for me, the message to the government is, we're gonna take the streets whatever we want, and we can empty the streets whenever we want as well. So to shower the power. I know that it has like a lot of impact, economic impact, especially for Nicaragua that is based on, that is based on informal economy, right? The price is really high. The price is really high. But we are determined to do something that has been one of the strategies. And also what happened that in, in July, that I showed you the video before, right? Of marshes, like a big marsh on the streets. That was before we had a new law that the government approved in uh, mid-July to, um, to claim that people that participate in this stuff are terrorists. So the main charges are for terrorism. So young people, well, for example, three of my friends are now in jail telling them that they are terrorists and they're only 20 years old that was on the university protesting. So now it's more complicated to, to do things now that we have that legal framework, right? So since April, these are the statistics, the hard statistics, right? So we have 455 people killed. We, we have more than 3,000 people injured from the crisis. And 20% are uh, in disability right now because they were like serious injured. We have more than 1,000 people disappear. We don't know if they're in jail, if they're dead, if they're in another country. We just only have that list of people disappear. And now we have more than 100 people, political prisoners. And political prisoners, I'm talking about terrorists. That's the big word in the country. Even we laugh about it. Like I'm saying I'm a terrorist, and we make fun of it because it's really hilarious to, to call them like that when we are just on the streets with a balloon, with, a, with our flag just walking by, right? So, And we also, I only bring the statistics from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is our neighbor, actually. So Costa Rica has been receiving Nicaraguan refugees. And they're, the building, they're like showing some numbers about the people that are leaving the country. So only at July 21st, 23,000 Nicaragua are going to Costa Rica to have um, refugee status. And they're refugee for political reasons because they're under threat. They have detention orders for, for uh, as terrorist attacks and, and things like that. And they're also um, refugees and economic level because the, common, the economy has suffered a lot. For example, 80% of our small enterprises have closed. The only one that have survived are the big hotels, the big restaurants, but the economy on itself has very, we have now that, that uh, tendency that decrease of 4% of our economy. So people are leaving basically because they don't have jobs, they don't have nothing to eat, they don't have opportunities inside the country to continue and to live in. So, and there's like Costa Rica now are saying that basically 200 on, on 500 new refugee claims per day to get into the country. And I'm not counting here the refugees that are coming to Canada, that are coming to Mexico, to Spain, to Guatemala. So it's actually a huge impact for the economy, but also for the people that are living in these conditions. And I bring the fact about the woman the, per the percentage of women that have been killed. And it's hard to say that the word is only 4%, but I'm, I, I want to tell you more about it because it's actually 4% of the people that have been killed, but there have been different expression of violence to the woman activists. So, so have you heard about the 
what happened in Syria is also happening in Nicaragua. So the women that, by, like myself, like young women are going to the street to, to claim for their rights or putting in jail as terrorists. There have been some women released and have shared their stories about sexual harassment, sexual assault, and different types of tortures. So one of them, um, because also like in Nicaragua with our culture, it's really hard to the woman to denounce that type of violence, so they rather not to talk about it. So we're asking to the UN if they have a report about the women that have been uh, sexual abuse and, and this type of repression to keep it confidential because they are not ready to talk about it. But a few women have the courage to go to the TV and say, this is what happened to me in jail. For example, they are saying that when you cut up, when the police got you, basically they say, take your clothes on, the clothes off, and do a squat in front of 10 guys just seeing you, and then keep you naked for three or four days. So, yeah. This, like, in Nicaragua, it's also really hard to do the investigations, right? We, we don't have the conditions, but we are trying to raise the voice of, the voice of those women that are saying the different forms of violence and repression that we live in just because we are women. And I must say that a lot of them, when they get up, they, when the police stop and say, you're going with me, when they talk to them, they say, they justify the fact that you shouldn't be in the protest. That's the space for men to be there. You should be at home doing whatever, and that's the way they justify all the type of repression that they are suffering in jail. So I want to like I want to say also that the situation is really hard, but as Nicaragua we have a culture to be happy as well, to keep the smile on. So. We're really colorful on the streets. We're really, we're singing, we're hugging each other, we are right there like trying to be accompanied. So as you can see, we don't have any political party flag. It's actually our flag, our main um, way to express ourselves. And actually wearing the flag right now in Nicaragua is considered terrorism. Because when I when I had two cases of a woman I was driving by and the police just stopped her and say, you have the white and blue flag, so you have to come with me because you're doing some terrorism attack. So I don't have any more my flag with me. I used to have it in my car and I'm really afraid now to have it because if I get stopped and I, they see the flag, they see, okay, you're against us, so you're going back to jail. You're, you're going to get in jail. So. But at the end, I'm really proud that we're using our flag, I must say, because we don't want to be associated for a political party because it's a civic movement, really. And what are our demands, right? The first one, like I said at the beginning, we want early elections with international observers. We don't want to wait until 2021. That's the first thing, right? The second thing is that we want justice for this for the assassinated citizens that disappear and the political prisoners. And we don't want the justice that the government is selling to us. For example, they just got up two guys and say they killed 20 people on the street, so they are the guilty ones. We don't want that. We also are really determined that the responsibility is actually for the government. So we want the president, the vice president, that by the way, the vice president is his wife, to be prosecuted for their human rights abuses. So we are talking about a dynasty because it was a family taking over the control. And there, his wife is a vice president. Their sons are in charge of the media. One son is in charge of the private sector uh, institution, uh, talking about the Grand Canal, for example. So we're saying they are the responsible. We don't want police officers that are just making their job, like listen to the orders of Ortega to kill people. We don't want that. We really want that they may become the responsible of the thing that's going on. And actually, the, the last, well, there is a lot, a huge list, right? Because I tried to choose for me that is more significant at the end. 
And the, uh, the final one, these are the disarmament of the paramilitary groups. This is really important for the long term, actually, because the government at the beginning of the protest just give guns to whatever to kill people, to be to make us afraid, and now we're living with that. So we have paramilitaries on the streets. We have people armed that act with impunity. So we're talking we can reconstruct Nicaragua if we still have the paramilitaries uh, with guns. And uh, just I just bring photos of my of my friends. They're actually for me it's really important to show you that this movement is trying to be inclusive. And it is a fight actually because in Nicaragua when you talk about feminism it's like ah you hate men so we don't want to talk to you or you just want to divide the fight we don't want to talk to the feminists right so we're really into the fight to saying the revolution has to be feminist or it's not going to be a revolution and we want inclusion in the movement so after the first protest we keep saying we want to make us visible so that's why my, my friends always has like a symbolic like things to show that we are there, the LGBTI are there, the feminists are there fighting for um, for democracy and justice. And then I, I want to bring you this photo because actually we use this to cover our face actually because we are afraid at the end we're going to be captured or whatever to be a terrorist or something. But it's actually very Nicaraguan. This is like a mask from Asaya that are made from indigenous communities and like very, they keep our traditions like in their main, like in their blood. So we want to use the mask to say, we are also part of this movement that are just working and, and doing what they can do the best. And also Masaya has been one of the bravest um, cities of all the country that show us to be brave, right? And I think my next slide is a video, and I want also to give you the video that even it's a hard situation and a hard context, we're still on the street, we, we are happy, we try to be inclusive, we still have hope. A lot of people keep asking me, what's the next step? So give us the result, give us the solution. It's really hard to say. Actually, it's really hard to say, but we are trying to do our best because we don't want corruption anymore to be the center of our culture. So I think I'm gonna show you this video. <laughs> Yeah. 
that phrase I'm trying to translate that for me it's like a very good summarize about the process is that we are now in a country more united with a collective conscience more proud of our uniqueness and also more inclusive so thank you <laughs> We've got time for questions for Marcella while she's still here. As we mentioned, Marcella obviously a wealth of knowledge, so I would definitely encourage you to ask some questions either on her experience, her approaches, her, um, I guess, learned lessons in her advocacy, as well as the work specifically she's doing in the garage. The floor is open to all of you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting us. Um, my man is born from Nicaragua, so we hear the shootings on the phone. Um, it's very scary and very nerve-wracking for him, so I'm getting emotional, sorry, because I think of him. Um, but I want to know, what are you doing to ensure that the information you're sharing on media is not being also, um, um, I guess, uh, shared with with Ortega's son who is overseeing the media aspect of it. So <clears throat> how is that being controlled is what I'm trying to ask. Actually <clears throat> the first four, four months of process it was really hard actually because there was fake news everywhere and the control that Ortega has right now in the media is huge. So there have been like different strategies. The first one, it would really, we really try to value the impact of social media when he doesn't have any control. So Facebook and Twitter have been being a really good weapon of it. The second thing is to make sure what pages or what websites you share information about because like I said, there is a lot of fake news that Ortega wants to show the world and know their perspective of the crisis, so they have been showing us that the violent and the repressive are the civic movement and not them, mm -hmm. because they manipulate the information. So for us, for the activist, it has been very important, one, to keep the social media going, to have a strategy on it, so there is a lot of, for example, SOS Nicaragua, Alianza Civica, there is like a few pages that bring the real information of our situation. We have also um, trying to identify those pages and to block the ones that are really trying to get the fake news like on the center of the of the of the debate. I must say that CNN <coughs> CNN has been like they have like every night they have for six months or something they were talking about Nicaragua. So I remember like I've never used Twitter actually I only use Facebook. And when I keep really excited on Facebook, I keep posting every day. I remember that was really hectic and emotional. And then an uncle that sadly is Ortegista called me and said, be careful, we're watching. So I stopped using Facebook and I created an anonymous account on Twitter where I just say whatever I want and feel free to do that. But it's actually, we are trying also that the connections with the countries, like for example, when I've been talking with another, like Canada, whatever, we say, please keep us on the agenda. Let's talk about Nicaragua, and it's really hard to get there because there is a lot of competition going on, like Venezuela. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, no, Nicaragua is Venezuela. No, no, it's not the same. There's <laughs> some difference about it, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. the only thing that we are trying to do to to look for allies on the international media to keep Nicaragua on the agenda, to get the information for the civic movement. Because actually, as I said, in Nicaragua, there's two only open channels that are talking about the crisis, and they're 24-7 giving news. So we try to do those 
channels also be a, pri a priority for the citizens that will to watch the news over what's going on the other side, right? So. Um, yeah, I can I can like write down. I don't have my I, I can write down the the pages that I consider that are real that are working on the place that are that that comes from the civic movement. I can do that. I can just write down afterwards. I'll be doing in PowerPoint because of like a few. Um, even I have to say that. Even the feminists are debating about this. We need to be in the social media talking about this because they also when the news are very doesn't have that side. So we were trying also to occupy the social media to say to have that more inclusive voices and stuff. But yeah, I can share some. Um, well, I think thank you for sharing your experience. And you um, and also, um, I'm from the media. Uh, and we have kind of similar issues with the government. Yeah. Um, but maybe we have to decide, like, we have a second option. Who do you want to do? Like, you, um, let's say, but you have that, like, uh, opportunity to be at some early election. We have someone that we know is going to help the country to get better with that? Actually, that's a good question because at the beginning, I was, if the people get tired, they say, okay, we're going to march, but after our data, what's next? That's a big question. And it's a big question because we don't want to repeat the mistakes that we have made over the past years. What I mean that our data wasn't the revolution. We believe in Ortega because we were tired of that capitalism or whatever, right? So when he got back to 2007, we believe that he was coming from the past to do a revolution in the country. So it is an important question, and I think we're working on it. And I get frustrated sometimes because I want to leave. So I'm really close to the Civic Alliance. They, 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 they keep telling me it's not the time, Martha, because if we came out with a name, it will be the first target to Ortega. And it will kill him or her or will disappear because we have some back, some history about it. Actually, in 2011, for the second period, there was a guy called Herbie de Witters that all of us were excited. We were going to vote for him. He was the solution. We kind of been tired of Daniel Ortega, and also Herbie comes from the Sandinista party, but with a different vision, right? So he appeared dead five days before the elections. And we still have the question about what happened really, right? So I, I'm, I'm, we are trying to say that the strategy is Ortega, the moment he leaves, we are going to work on it. How to have like a temporal government for some period to organize ourselves for early elections or nearly the elections to come up with a name when we feel the condition and the security to do that. But if we come with a solution right now, it will be really dangerous for the person that decides to to come on to be a, to be a candidate. But yeah, there is names. There is names around talking about the fact I have few names. Um, but we are trying to be really critical and say we want the not the perfect one because it's never gonna be the perfect one, but no one from the past. We don't want because right now actually it's really funny that due to the movement, like like politicians from the past are saying, Okay, so now we can handle this. Vote for me. We don't want to play anymore. So they're trying to capture all the social movement and say, for example, Arnold Aleman, one of the most corrupt government that we have, now he's on TV saying, vote for me, please. I have the solution. I'm saying, no, we don't want that. No one from the past. We, have, we want a new leadership. We still don't know who, but yeah. I think that is why we don't have a name ready.
at the moment. Do you feel that your movement is moved as own, or do you fear that it might be this I'm thinking, I think it's growing. Well, the immigration is an issue, right? right. But the people, I, I think feeling the energy that the people that is living in Nicaragua is doing something from their space to put this in our agenda, to talk about it, to raise awareness. And actually, a lot of 23 countries that at the beginning were allies from Ortega saying, right now, we condemn you. It give you like a, like, like the, like the essence that people are getting aware about the true face of Ortega. So I think it's growing now because of it, because we are sharing information. We have uh, reports really based on evidence that really tell us that Ortega is the one that is behind all, all of this. So yeah, I think it's growing. And now we have to look for the strategies to continue on this very hostile environment, but we're doing what we feel like is our best to do. And I just want to say as well that we are afraid, I say we, I feel people, I didn't say I, I'm not afraid that people get tired. I mean, it's, 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 it's logical, like six months of crisis is a long term crisis. And we are afraid that people think that we are back to normal. So people like, I just want to go to work. I just want to, I don't want more barricades. I don't want to, uh, they, they're trying. And Cortez is really promoting the fact that we have to go back to normal because the terrorists are already in jail. So it is a fight also to keep the motivation, to keep the hope, to keep the idea that we can still change things. So it's a struggle as well to keep the moving, keep the movement going, right? Yeah. So how are you guys surviving? Obviously, as you said, there's an economic problem, right? Yeah. So the food, how are you guys getting your food? Like, are you are you getting any other support from any other countries coming in? Obviously, to condemn or Ortega. What are you guys doing to survive? Because I know from my man's family, they're in crisis. I mean, just getting. Anywhere is an issue, as you said, but but food and, and you know you're, you're you're barricaded many times in your own home and you hear the shootings in the background. They thank God they have cell phones yeah. that they have some sort of means of communicating. But how are you getting that? Like mm -hmm. what what is keeping you guys still being nourished? That's part of the sacrifice, actually, and it's really hard because we are aware that the movement are based from that sector that doesn't have any capital, doesn't have savings, that are living the everyday life. So, and that's why also a lot of people are leaving Nicaragua because they don't have more opportunities, they have no jobs, they don't have like, is 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 yeah. For example, as I was talking to Lorena, I mean Nicaragua is think I'm going to stay I want to stay, and I think I'm going to stay because I feel that security that I have, I mean, come at least, right, to be there. But I know that a lot of families are suffering. And even, like, the gap between the, the recognition of human rights has, like, a, has a, has a, growing up so, so fast, for example, Water is a need that we had before the crisis. We have dry season, we have drought. People are getting really hard to har harvest and whatever. And now in this crisis, it's getting like more, more complicated to still doing that work. So yes, I must say that it's really hard to survive right now in Nicaragua. It's really, really hard. And I do understand the people that decide to leave because it's really hard to sustain, even if we are in a formal economy. But it's also really inspiring that people that say, that have created like support networks between them. I hear about a community that, uh, um, there is a family that, that grows like coffee and rice and the small things, and they're sharing with other people. 
We also have support for citizens that are just sending money so the people can survive. So actually, the people that have family outside Nicaragua are helping them to survive at this time that is really hard. So unfortunately, I don't have the answer. I want to say that, but I want to acknowledge that there are some people that are very, very bad in the and they're trying to get help wherever they can. And an option is to leave the, the country. Another option is to have that network with another community, with another neighbor. That's happening a lot. People in Nicaragua that have family outside that are connecting and give them like money on everyday basis. So yeah, I want to say that is kind of hard, right? That's the, the sacrifices are really high. I I didn't leave the revolution in the 70s. So for me, it's all new. For me, it's like a war. And my mom said, you don't know nothing about war. War is just something else. There's no what if you're, you're living right now. And I say, I feel like that. And we're trying to, yeah, to be there with each other, to create empathy, to connect with people, to connect with countries. Costa Rica has been a huge help, I must say. Costa Rica has been building shelters for Nicaragua in their countries to be there, to get there. So yeah, it depends. We are nearing one o'clock and we're going to be cognizant of time. Um, Martha, thank you so much for coming in. I think she deserves a huge round of applause. <laughs> Um, we at the Intercultural Center are really emphasizing um, the role that we all play um, and really encouraging this idea of global citizenship. I think Martha absolutely exudes and exemplifies um, exactly what we hope to be able to achieve and what the world might look like if we all had a little bit of Martha in all of us. Mm -hmm. um, as Laura mentioned, we do have our program, I Advocate, that we are starting after college. So if there are causes that you believe in, that you are working towards, that you are dedicating your time to, we absolutely encourage you to come by, talk to us about this, and just like Martha, be able to be in front of an audience and share those causes in front of our campus community. Martha, thank you so much. Lorraine, thank you so much for coming. Um, and of course, International Education, thank you for facilitating this and making this connection. We all hope that you uh, came away with something today. And if you have any questions, we'll be here. And I think Martin might be here for a few minutes. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.